Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and welcome back for part 3 of Mesozoic Earth History. So before we go any further, let's just get the code word out of the way. The code word for this presentation is Beowulf. I repeat, Beowulf. That's B-E-O-W-U-L-F. So one more time, that's Beowulf. So please make sure you write that down and put it somewhere safe because you'll need it for the code word quiz. Okay, so now we're going to move on to Mesozoic Tectonics. So obviously tectonics in the Mesozoic are going to be focused along what is now the modern day western coast of North America. So the development of the Cordelian uh, mobile belt is a very complex story, so it has you know, several parts to it. Now, the driving force of the creation of this mobile belt was the eastward subduction of the oceanic crust of the Farallon Plate underneath the North American Plate. So as we know, we have a rift opening up along what is the modern day east coast of North America. And of course, this rift opening up is going to start pushing North America to the west. Now, in order to accommodate this movement, obviously the North American plate has to roll over the top of the oceanic crust to the west of it. And this oceanic crust is the Farallon plate. So the Farallon plate has to start subducting underneath North America to allow North America to move in a westerly direction. Now, this subduction zone that forms results in the thickening of the continental crust along what is the modern day west coast of North America. It leads to the formation of an extensive accretionary wedge. So an accretionary wedge essentially is a pile of material which forms at the subduction zone and it's material that gets scraped off the subducting oceanic crust. So it's a mixture of marine sediments, little bits of oceanic crust, you know, and then you get the occasional odd little, you know, maybe a bit of continental crust mixed in there as well. So it's a bit of a mess. It also led to the accretion of island arcs onto the western side of North America, because of course we have a subduction zone. Every once in a while an island arc is just going to come along and stick itself onto the side. Obviously we have a subduction zone, so that's going to produce quite a lot of volcanism, and most of this volcanism is going to be contained within the mobile belt, which runs along, which ran along the modern day uh, west coast of North America. And of course, in order to feed the volcanoes, we've got to have lots of intrusions making their way into the thickened continental crust. And of course, because this is a subduction zone, these intrusions are going to be felsic to intermediate in composition. Now, until the Mesozoic, with the exception of the late Devonian to early Carboniferous antler orogeny, the western side of North America had pretty much experienced zero tectonism. So it had been a, a relatively passive environment until we move into the Mesozoic. So we're actually going to start off with the Sonoma orogeny. So the Sonoma orogeny starts in the late Permian and it goes through to the early Triassic. So in the late Permian, we get a subduction zone developing off the western coast of North America. And this, uh, this subduction zone is forming due to the uh, essentially the latter stages of a Wilson cycle. So along the western coast of North America here, an ocean basin has opened up due to rifting. And now at this point, it starts to close. And obviously, in order to close, it has to form a subduction zone along one side of the, uh, of the basin in order to destroy the oceanic crust that's formed. So the subduction zone that formed, formed off the basin's western margin. So the basin itself is going to be located approximately here, and you're going to have a microcontinent located over here. And the subduction zone is going to be along the western side of the basin. So you're going to have the oceanic crust here subducting in a westward direction underneath this little microcontinent, which is off the coast here. And the destruction of this oceanic crust is eventually going to lead to the collision between North America and the Sonoma terrain, which is this little microcontinent. So, as I said, the Sonoma terrain was a volcanically active microcontinent which was located off the western coast of North America. And of course, what happens is when we get this collision, it actually it causes rocks to be thrust in an easterly direction. So this kind of gives you some idea of what's going on here. So obviously we have our, uh, this is Sonoma, so this is our little microcontinent here, and here we have the, what's the western coast of North America over here. And so we had our oceanic crust separating the two. And so what happened is the oceanic crust that was separating the two was subducting in a westward direction underneath Sonoma. 
However, of course, eventually that oceanic crust got subducted away. It's gone. It's now down in the mantle. And so this eventually led to the collision of the continental crust of the Sonoma microcontinent with the continental crust of the western coast of North America. So the frost sequence that forms, and you can see that the frost sequence that forms produces a eastward movement, so the rocks are being pushed towards the east, and this leads to the thickening of the Sonoma crust and the formation of a mountain range. So the frost sequence itself contains a mixture of granites and gneisses, so that's continental crust, felsic volcanics, because of course we know the Sonoma, uh, the Sonoma microcontinent would have been volcanically active because it was directly on top of a subduction zone. Uh, we also have marine limestone, sandstones and mudstones, so that represents sediments that were on top of the oceanic crust. And we also have the occasional bit of basalt mixed in there as well, and that represents part of the seafloor that occasionally got mixed up within the rocks of the mountain building event. So this period of frosting, essentially the thickening of the crust, produces a mountain range, and this is referred to as the Sonoma orogeny, because of course an orogeny is a mountain building event. And it produces a relatively small mountain chain that sits off the west coast of uh, North America. So we have the Sonoma uh, microcontinent here, we have North America here, in between we have a, a narrow body of water which is underlain by continental crust. And of course the mountainous terrain that's uh, formed is called Sonomia. So just to give you some idea, here's the situation. So we have our basin forming off the western coast of uh, modern day North America. And so the basin in question is going to be approximately there. And so the oceanic crust is going to be destroyed, and that's going to lead to the collision of the Sonoma microcontinent with the western coast of North America, and it's going to lead to the formation of a orogeny right there. Now, there's actually quite a lot of uncertainty about the Sonoma orogeny, and that's because, as you can see from the picture here, the tectonics in this area at that time were actually rather complex. It looks like there were several small subduction zones operating in the area at the same time. So one of the problems we have is that geologists aren't even sure whether the subduction zone that caused the orogeny dipped to the east or the west. We think it probably dipped to the west, but we're not 100% certain about that. And of course, if your subduction zone is dipping in a completely different direction, of course, that's going to change how the whole orogeny will have taken place. And so this obviously means the Sonoma orogeny is still relatively strongly debated. We aren't 100% sure what's going on. So, you know, please bear that in mind. So at the end of the Sonoma orogeny, subduction ceased and the western coast of North America became a passive margin. So if we look at the geologic timescale over here, we can see there's the Sonoma orogeny straddling the Permian-Triassic boundary. And you can see that once the Sonoma orogeny finishes, we have a period with little to no tectonic activity taking place. So the western coast has become a passive margin. Now, during the early Jurassic, we get subduction fully restarting along the west coast. And this leads to the formation of a steeply dipping subduction zone. Now, as we've discussed, the formation in the subduction zone is due to the westward movement of North America over the oceanic Farallon Plate. And of course, this is a direct reflection of the rifting that's taking place along the eastern side of North America, which eventually is going to lead to the formation of the Atlantic Basin. Now, the subduction zone that forms is going to control tectonism along the western side of North America from the early Jurassic all the way into the Cenozoic. So it's going to be you know, active for a period of 140 million years. So it's a pretty long lived uh, orogenic event. And the start of subduction along the western coast of, uh, of North America marks the beginning of the formation of the modern, modern circum-Pacific orogenic system. So of course this is the ring of uh, volcanically active uh, mountain ranges that form along the edge of the modern day Pacific. So the Cordelian orogeny occurred between the Middle Jurassic and the Middle Paleogene, so it's a very extensive orogeny. 
Now, it consists of a series of individual mountain building events that occurred in different portions of the uh, Cordelian Mobile Belt at different times. So it's not that we're forming one big mountain range all the way along the western side of North America at one time. What we have are smaller mountain building events that lead to the uplift of the western side of North America at different times and in different locations. There is obviously going to be some degree of overlap, though, because orogenic events are quite large. So, you know, you can have you know, more than one orogenic event occurring in the same area at the same time. Now, as discussed, most of the tectonism that we see is related to North America's westward movement over the Farallon Plate. So the first stage is the Nevadian orogeny. And... This, this begins in the late Jurassic and it continues into the Cretaceous. So if we just go back to the previous slide, we can see here we go. The Nevadian orogeny is starting here in the middle to late Jurassic and it's going to go through to the middle Cretaceous. So the subduction of the Farallon Plate produced considerable volumes of magma. And this magma is going to be of a felsic to intermediate composition. This magma is going to intrude the crust. And obviously a lot of that magma gets trapped in the crust. So it will crystallize to form plutonic igneous rocks. And so obviously most of the plutonic igneous rocks you're going to get are going to be granites in the case of a felsic magma. And granite and diorite, sorry, in the case of an intermediate magma. Of course, if you remember, uh, of the magma that makes its way into the crust, only a small fraction of it actually gets erupted onto the surface. So most of the magma that tries to make its way through the Earth's crust actually gets stuck and cools underground and solidifies to give us plutonic rocks. So the, the volcanic rocks that we see on the surface of the Earth are a fraction of the total amount of magma being produced. Okay, so let's start with the Nevadian orogeny, so Middle Jurassic to Early Cretaceous. So the rifting that begins along, uh, off North America's east coast obviously gives North America a westward push, and this causes North America to move over the Farallon Plate, and it produces a steeply dipping subduction zone. And of course, this is going to lead to the formation of a mountain range, and the modern example would be something like the Andes. So in the case of the Andes, you have the Nazcar plate subducting in an eastward direction underneath the South American plate. It would have been pretty much exactly the same process, and it would have resulted in the same kind of mountain range. So obviously we're going to form a thickened portion of continental crust along the modern day west coast of North America. And this uh, area of thickened crust is going to have mass added to it by the accretion of volcanic island arcs onto the western coast due to the subduction zone. The accretion of marine sediments onto the western coast of North America, once again, due to the subduction zone, and also the emplacement of baffleth, so the intrusive events, so this, these are these felsic and intermediate magmas intruding the mountain range. And all of these factors combined, along with the tectonic deformation that's going to thicken the crust, ends up producing quite an extensive mountain range that's going to be running from Alaska all the way down to the US-Mexican border. So here is our situation in the late Triassic. So you can see that on the whole, not a whole lot going on. It's all relatively peaceful. You can see we have a, a bit of topography down here, but on the whole, the West Coast is relatively flat. Now, as we move into the early Jurassic, you can see once again, the terrain is on the whole relatively flat. Now you can see we do have a subduction zone operating over here. And by the time we're moving into the early Jurassic, you can see we have several uh, lines of volcanic island chains, which are steadily going to be moving towards the west coast. And as we move into the middle Jurassic, you can suddenly see we have a significant change in the topography. So here we go. So you can see all of a sudden we have a noticeable thickening of the topography along the western coast of North America. You can see the mountain range forming there. So this is the start of the Nevadian orogeny. So, of course, what we've got is we've got our subduction zone here. So this is allowing North America to move westwards over the Farallon Plate. And, of course, this movement is causing this area of continental crust here to begin to deform and thicken. So on top of that, of course, we then have uh, volcanic island arcs, which are sticking themselves onto the side of North America. We have the emplacement of marine sediments, which are being scraped off the Farallon Plate, and essentially they are, they are being added to the western coast of North America. 
and obviously this entire region here is going to be volcanically active because of the subduction and that's going to lead to the emplacement of large amounts of magma into this thickened crust which are going to cool and solidify to give us granites and diorites and that's going to help to add extra mass to our mountain range. So as we can see, as we move into the late Jurassic, we can still see we have our raised terrain here. You can see a lot of it is located up here in the uh, approximately at the Canadian US border. And we can see by the early Cretaceous that we have the Nevadian orogeny finishing. And you can see we have a well-established ridge, essentially a thickened crust running along the entire west coast of North America. And we can see the subduction zone is still operational. We can see also we have numerous smaller volcanic island arcs which are very quickly heading to the west coast of North America. And of course, they will eventually uh, make contact. So as we've discussed, the uh, Nevadian orogenic event is going to produce a large amount of magma as part of the subduction process. And this magma is going to be of a felsic to intermediate composition. So this magma is going to make its way into the crust. And of course, magma on the whole likes to take the path of least resistance. So it's going to take the easiest route to try and move through the crust that it can. And so what this means is, is you get the same conduits being exploited again and again and again. So every time a new pulse of magma enters the crust, it will simply follow the easiest path. And that typically that's a, a path that's been followed by an intrusive event earlier. And so this means that you end up getting repeated pulses of intrusions into the same region along what is now the modern day western coast of North America. And so what we see when we look at the uh, Nevadian batholiths is we see that they are located in four broad groups. So the first group are the Sierra Nevada batholiths, which are located down here. We have the Southern Californian batholiths located over here. We have the Idaho batholith located here. And we have the Coast Range Batholith located here. And so what we have, what a batholith is essentially, is it's just simply an area of the continental crust that has been intruded multiple times. And so you end up building up a very, very large volume of plutonic igneous rocks, typically granites and diorites. So we know the crust was being actively deformed by the Farallon plate subduction underneath North America and that's obviously going to lead to the crust thickening and we know these intrusions are adding extra mass to the continental crust as they're being emplaced into it. We also know as we've said that we have these island arcs sticking themselves onto the western side of North America that's adding extra mass as well and to top it all off we also have the addition of sediments which are being scraped off the top of the subducting Farallon plate those are also going to stick themselves onto the side of North America and we see the subduction process from a sedimentary point of view represented by the formation of two distinct blocks of sedimentary rock. So we have the Franciscan complex and the Great Valley group, and these are both associated with the Nevadian orogeny. So the Franciscan complex is a maximum of 7,000 meters thick, so it's a pretty substantial thickness of sedimentary rocks and it consists of a very chaotic mixture of rocks accumulated during the late Jurassic and Cretaceous. Now the chaotic nature of these sedimentary, ro sedimentary rocks is a really strong indicator of exactly what's forming them or should I say what's forming the complex. So the complex contains grey wackies, siltstones, black shales, cherts, a mixture of so these are continental marginal sediments we have volcanic breaches and you know so these are island arc deposits we have pillowed basalts obviously that's oceanic crust and we have blue schist that's metamorphosed uh, oceanic crust and so we have a, a mixture of both marine sediments volcanic island arc igneous rocks oceanic crust igneous rocks and metamorphosed oceanic crust and so this chaotic mixture of strongly deformed and brecciated rocks is referred to as a melange, which if you know French, essentially translates into mixture. And this, uh, this means that the collection of rocks that makes up the Franciscan complex is actually an accretionary wedge. So this is material that's being scraped off the top 
of the Farallon plate as it subducts under the North American plate. Now, when you put it in that context, all of a sudden it begins to make sense. So the marine sediments, well, they were sitting on top of the Farallon plate and they got scraped off and got stuck onto the side of the North American plate. The volcanic breaches, well, that makes sense because, of course, mixed in with, well, sitting on top of the Farallon plate, should I say, you're going to have volcanic island arcs, so they're going to get mixed in there as well. The pillowed basalts, well, that represents the top layer of the oceanic crust, so every once in a while some of that will get scraped off as well and gets mixed into the complex. And the blue schists, well, of course, that represents oceanic crust that's been metamorphosed, so it must have been subducted to some degree, and then faulting will probably have brought it back towards the surface so it can then be incorporated into the complex. And so the presence of the Franciscan complex is quite useful to us because it helps us to gauge approximately where the trench would have been located for the Nevadian orogeny. Now, the Franciscan complex and the Great Valley group that lies to the southeast of it are separated by a major frost fault, and that's not really a huge surprise. This is obviously going to be a very tectonically active area, so the presence of faults is going to be pretty ubiquitous. So here's our basic setup. So the Franciscan complex you can see is marked out on the diagram here in the pink. And you'll notice it has an approximately northwest southeast orientation. And so this is giving us essentially an approximate orientation for the trench of the Nevadian orogeny. That is also going to run parallel to the Franciscan group. And so we know the trench for the Nevadian orogeny was also probably orientated northwest southeast. If we look at the location of the Franciscan complex, so here's the Farallon plate over here, here's North America over here, and we can see the Farallon plate is subducting underneath North America in an easterly direction. And we can see this is the accretionary wedge right here. So this is all the material that's being scraped off the top of the Farallon plate as it subducts down underneath the North American plate. Now the Great Valley group is located behind the Franciscan complex. So it's located along what would have been the coastline of North America. So the Great Valley group consists of 16,000 meters of uh, clastic sediments which are a mixture of conglomerates, sandstones, siltstones and shales and they were deposited into a continental shelf environment so what we have here is we have material that's being eroded off the nevadian erogeny so off the nevadian mobile belt the high ground that's forming as a result of this erogeny of course where we have elevated terrain that leads to faster rates of erosion and so we're going to have lots of sediment being formed and this sediment is going to come off the uh, Nevadian highlands obviously it's going to go in two directions some of it will go into the center of the continental United States and some of it will be deposited along the western coast of North America and that's going to lead to the formation of the Great Valley Group. So the Great Valley Group essentially represents the material being eroded off the Nevadian highlands. So by the late Cretaceous most of the volcanic and plutonic activity had begun to migrate eastwards into Nevada and Idaho. So if we look at the situation here where we have the Nevadian orogeny, we started off with a period where we had a relatively steep subduction zone. And so this meant that our oceanic crust was dropping down into the mantle quite quickly. And so it reached this dashed line here. And this dashed line is approximately 150 kilometers down inside the Earth. And this essentially is the, the magic point in the mantle at which oceanic crust will begin to dewater. Obviously, that water then enters the overlying mantle rocks and of course it causes them to melt due to hydration melting so the addition of water and of course this then creates a mafic magma this mafic magma then gets stuck at the base of the continental crust of course this mafic magma has a temperature of somewhere in the region of around 1100 1200 celsius so it's very very hot the felsic igneous rocks of the continental crust can melt anywhere down to about 700 Celsius. And so obviously you have a very hot magma in contact with rocks that have a relatively low melting point, And so the rocks begin to melt. And of course, it's the melting of the continental crust that ends up leading to the formation of the felsic and intermediate magmas that feed the volcanoes, which are part of the Nevadian highlands. 
So the most important thing is, is because the oceanic crust is dipping steeply at this point, it reaches the 150 kilometer depth relatively soon after the subduction zone. And so this means the volcanoes are located quite near the trench. Now, what we see later on is we begin to see, as we move uh, towards the end of the Nevadian orogeny, we see the volcanic activity beginning to move inland to the east. So this is highly suggestive of the angle of subduction changing. Now this means because the angle of subduction will be getting shallower, it means it takes a lot longer for the subducting oceanic crust to hit the, the magic 150 kilometer depth. And so this means the oceanic crust won't start dewatering until much further underneath North America. And so this means you don't get magma generation until the oceanic crust is well underneath North America. And of course, this therefore means that the volcanic activity is going to move away from the trench. And this is what we begin to see towards the end of the Nevadian orogeny. So this then brings us on to the Seaver orogeny. I should point out, by the way, the Seaver orogeny, I've also heard it pronounced as the Severe orogeny or the Sevier orogeny. So, you know, there are, there are a few ways of pronouncing this one, but I believe the correct pronunciation is Seaver. So the Seaver orogeny starts in the late Jurassic and goes through to the late Cretaceous. So it's following on after the Nevadian orogeny, but it's also occurring at the same time as the Nevadian orogeny, just to add a new layer of complexity. So it's the second stage of the Cordelian orogeny, and it affects North America from Alaska all the way down to Mexico. So this is a very extensive orogenic event. Now, as we just discussed, we know as we begin to transition from the Nevadian orogeny into the, um, into the Siva orogeny, we have this shallowing of the angle of subduction. And this means that the stresses which were focused along the front edge of the subduction zone are now being spread throughout a larger volume of rock. And now this means that the subducting oceanic crust is going to spend more time grinding against the underside of the North American crust. And so this means we also have stresses being applied to areas of the crust that were previously unaffected by the earlier Nevadian orogeny. Now, the movement of these tectonic stresses inland is going to lead to substantial amounts of thrust faulting. So that's going to lead to sheets of rock being pushed up one on top of another. And of course, this is going to lead to, a, to the formation of a mountain range. So it's going to lead to the formation of topography. So this diagram kind of summarizes the basic situation. So at the top here, we have the Nevadian orogeny. So we have our Farallon plate marked here as a thick black line, which is happily subducting underneath North America. And we have quite a steep subduction zone. So we can see that most of the, the interface between the two plates is going to be located right here, right at the front edge of the, uh, the subduction zone. And so this is where most of the stresses are going to be located. And of course, we're going to have lots of uh, mantle melting taking place here. So so we end up building up a mountain range right here, right on the front edge of the continental crust. So this is the kind of situation we have in an area like uh, the Andes, for instance. Now, what we see as we move into the Siva orogeny is we see the angle of subduction getting shallower. Now, as we've discussed, this means that volcanism begins to move eastward, so inland. But at the same time, it also means that we have a, a much greater area that's actively interacting with the subducting oceanic Farallon plate. And so this means the stresses, these tectonic stresses, are no longer being focused right at the front here. They're being spread out throughout a much larger volume of rock. And so this means that areas to the east of the Nevadian highlands are all of a sudden going to begin to experience compressive tectonic forces. And so this is going to lead to quite large amounts of thrust faulting. And this is going to lead to the formation of the, of the, um, of the Siva highlands, essentially. So by the late Cretaceous, the thrust that went and formed as part of this event reached the, uh, uh, reached the Idaho Washington border. So once again, we have these very, very large thrust faults. So this diagram kind of summarizes what's going on. So obviously we, ha we would initially have had the Nevadian Highlands on the front edge here, and then we steadily have this eastward movement that ends up producing the, um, 
the uh, Siva Frost Fold Belt, so the Siva Highlands, and these are going to be a mixture of, you know, of, of frosted uh, continental crust, and mixed in with that frosted continental crust, you're going to have large amounts of uh, plutonic igneous rocks helping to add extra mass. Now, these low angle frost faults push large blocks of Paleozoic age rocks eastwards over the younger Mesozoic rocks. And the frosting resulted in crustal shortening and the production and produced, sorry, a general north south trend to the mountain range that stretched all the way from Western Canada to Montana. That's where most of the deformation was located. So we end up with an approximately north-south uh, mountain range, which has been produced essentially because the crust is getting squished by the compressive tectonics, which isn't really a huge surprise. So here's our situation in the early Cretaceous. So of course you can see that we already have uh, topography established along the western coast. Of course, that's going to be primarily due to the Nevadian orogeny. And then we're going to start moving into the uh, uh, into the Siva orogeny and we know that most of the deformation is going to be located up in this area here and so as we move into the into as we move further into the Cretaceous you can begin to see a noticeable widening of the zone okay so if we sorry go on to father if we look in this area in particular what you're going to see is you're going to see the width of the mountain range beginning to increase as the deformation starts to push push eastwards so once again here's the nevadian highlands and as we move into the cretaceous even further we can see things are the mountain range is beginning to broaden a little bit over here and then by the time we are into the early Cretaceous, well, further into the Cretaceous, you can see the mountain range has now almost doubled in width. And that's because we're forming the Siva Frost Fold Belt along the eastern margin of the already existing Nevadian Highlands. So during the late Cretaceous and into the Paleogene, we see the final pulse of uh, mountain building in the Cordelian Orogeny, and this is going to lead to the Laramide Orogeny. So the Laramide orogeny starts in the late Cretaceous and it goes through into the middle Paleogene. So obviously we're going to discuss it in a little now, but most of the discussion is actually going to take place in the Cenozoic Earth History Lecture. So the Laramide orogeny occurred further east than the previous two pulses. So the Laramide orogeny is going to broaden the, uh, the mountain range that's forming even more. So the Nevadian orogeny was located close to the trench, then it's then tectonism starts to move eastwards, that gives us the uh, the Siva orogeny, and then finally tectonism is going to move even further eastwards, and that's going to give us the deformation associated with the Laramide orogeny. Now this eastward shift is, as we've already discussed, the result of the shallowing of the angle of subduction. So we initially started off with a subduction zone that was dipping at about 50 degrees. This is going to be the Nevadian orogeny. And by the time we make it to the Laramide orogeny, the subducting oceanic crust is going to be subducting at a near horizontal angle. So it's going to be moving underneath the North American plate at approximately 90 degrees. So it is, well, actually, 90 degrees would actually be pointing straight down at approximately zero degrees. There's going to be no dip on it, give or take a little bit. And of course, this is going to cause a change in the tectonism. And so as part of the Nevadian and the uh, and the Siva orogeny, we obviously have these areas where we have the tectonic pressures being essentially concentrated into a relatively small area. And so this is going to lead to higher pressure tectonics. So it's going to lead to the formation of things like frost faults. Now, what happens is, is because by the time we're at the Laramide orogeny, the tectonic stresses are now being spread out over a much larger volume of rock, all of a sudden we begin to see the deformation becoming maybe not quite so intense. So we do get some faulting, but we also get the formation of very big, very broad open folds as well. Now, 
As part of the laramide orogeny, we do get the formation of large near vertical reverse faults. And a lot of these reverse faults will actually be reactivated normal faults which formed you know, earlier on in Earth history. And you know, it, it's just simply a case of these faults are just, they're already there. There's a bit of tectonic stress, there's a bit of force, and so the blocks of rock can move and exploit these faults relatively easily because it's a pre-existing weakness. And this causes massive blocks to be upthrown, so to be pushed upwards. And this produces a region of elevated terrain that runs through New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming. So the majority of the uh, Laramide orogeny occurred in the Cenozoic. So we, as I said, we are going to cover it in greater detail in the Cenozoic Earth History Lecture. So this kind of gives you some idea of what we have. So here's our subduction zone. So here's our North American plate, and here's our subducting Farallon plate. And of course, we know initially the subducting Farallon plate would have been dipping quite steeply. That leads to the formation of the Nevadian Highlands right at the front. We know the angle begins to shallow, and that leads to the, the formation of the... Um, <clears throat> of the Siva Frost Fold Belt further inland, and by the time we make it into the Laramide Orogeny, we can see that the Farallon Plate is literally just grinding along the bottom of the continental crust for an extended period of time. And so this means the tectonic stresses that were being focused into this area are now being dissipated essentially and spread out over this very, very big region of crust here. And so that means, once again, tectonism, deformation is moving further eastwards, and this is going to result in the formation of the Rocky Mountains. And we can see here, here we have some of these steep reverse faults, which are pushing blocks of rock straight up. So, okay, so that was the basic rundown of Mesozoic tectonism. So this would be a good place to stop. So stop the video, get up, have a walk around, get a glass of water, take five, 10 minutes to relax, and then please come back for part four.